I believe that this is a massive, massive epidemic. Uh, there's something physiological going on here that is not in their head. The human organism is, is considered to be under uh, a much more massive uh, level of stress, but it's a different kind of stress. If someone you love has a chronic condition, especially something like adrenal fatigue, be supportive because no matter whether you know what adrenal, adrenal fatigue is or you think it's real or not, it doesn't matter. Your loved one is going through something. I'm Steve and I make films. I also suffer from what many people call adrenal fatigue. I guess one of the good things about me getting adrenal fatigue is that I'm a filmmaker. And so I know enough to be able to make this documentary. I've been working on this for about two years now, but uh, I, still, I still have adrenal fatigue. I'm not all the way better. I still have to sleep a lot. I still have days where I'm in bed a lot, uh, where I can barely do anything, where I have fatigue, I have brain fog. I can't think some days well enough to work on this. I'm halfway through with shooting of the documentary for adrenal fatigue. Um, last three out of the four days I've felt extreme exhaustion, been hardly able to do anything. But I'm not gonna stop, right? I'm gonna finish this documentary because it's it's just very important to me to finish this because I feel like it's been something that's been given to me to do, uh, to help people who who have it, to people who need this documentary. I have two main goals for this documentary. One is to help people who are suffering with this condition, whatever it is. And the second is to bring this condition to the attention of the mainstream medical community. At the moment, they don't recognize it. When Steve told me he was going to make this documentary, I thought that it was an important subject because so many people are suffering from this. And honestly, everyone to some degree in my experience is going to go down this path. Either they're on it right now or they're going to be on it, where they're going to start getting that energy decline and their body's going to start breaking down too young. It's happening too young, right? Things that shouldn't happen until we're 80 or 90 are happening to people in their 20s and 30s. We need, to, we need to confront this, we need to study it, we need to understand it. I want to direct people to the best information that I have found. And that's why I'm talking to over 20 doctors for this documentary and getting all the different solutions. I'm compiling all the different solutions together in one place and you can look at them and see which ones you think are going to work for you because everybody's different and hopefully some of them will help but I've noticed that these doctors tend to agree a lot on a lot of things that you can do and so those things are the things I'm really going to highlight to bring to you. Currently, adrenal fatigue, unfortunately, has become this catch-all for all different kinds of problems and symptoms. Adrenal fatigue falls in that gray area type of diagnosis in medicine where they don't know really what it is, what caused it, or how to fix it or cure it. So the symptoms tend to be everything from brain fog to low energy, problems sleeping, to even physical pain and muscular type of aches and, and issues. They come in and they're weight loss resistance, they have inflammation, some people are in pain, um, anxiety, depression, brain fog, just feeling like they're just trying to get by every single day. Well, when we look at the subject of how do you define adrenal fatigue, that's really kind of a core of what some of the issue is on why adrenal fatigue is not as well recognized as other syndromes. I'm going to define it simply as the body's stress response gone on too long, which will create a cascade of varied symptoms in different individuals. I think of various symptoms. I think of fatigue, obviously. I think of uh, trouble sleeping, potential mood issues like anxiety and depression. I think of general nutrient depletion. So something's running down. The body doesn't have what it needs. Um, often I'll think of maybe that a person's been under a lot of stress, Maybe they have infections, maybe they haven't been sleeping enough, working too hard. Um, so I, I look at it as a combination problem that, that likely has a source. It's not just the adrenals are tired. 
People have uh, sleeping issues, uh, low energy through the day, a lot of naps during the day, unable to sleep at night, that sort of reversal of day-night. Those are all sort of classic signs of adrenal fatigue. It's like a paradox where you're chronically fatigued, you don't feel like you have enough energy to you know, get through your day, um, you know, you, there's immune system issues with it, all kind of hormonal imbalances that occur when, when people are going through this, but yet when it's time to go to bed, sometimes they're, they're wired. They're like wound up having trouble falling asleep. So as exhausted as they are, they're still not even finding, you know, the right pattern. What a lot of people don't recognize with adrenal fatigue is that there's actually a hyper phase. You know, we think of adrenal fatigue as just being wiped out all the time, not adapting to stress. But there's a time where you're not adapting to stress, but you're also almost revved up. It's not a good energy, though. It's an energy that you know is based on adrenaline. I have definitely experienced the hyper phase of adrenal fatigue. I would get stuck in a very anxious state for many days at a time. This is different. This adrenal fatigue anxiety is dread horror anxiety. And that's what it was like. During the day when I was awake, it felt like I was in a nightmare. All the time. It felt like a nightmare, like something horrible was going to happen any minute and there was nothing I could do about it. I was just living in a nightmare. During my search for experts for this documentary, I was able to find an endocrinologist, a specialist on hormones and adrenal glands, who is also a researcher into the phenomenon of adrenal fatigue. I didn't have to travel far for the interview since she was already located in Los Angeles. Yeah, so that's an interesting question. I actually see a fair number of patients who come in with a diagnosis of adrenal fatigue. And adrenal fatigue isn't really a diagnosis that's recognized by endocrinologists, which is what I am. And so I often find that patients who come in complaining of adrenal fatigue or have had adrenal fatigue actually have a much bigger and broader story that I need to unpack. And that label and diagnosis of adrenal fatigue doesn't necessarily capture what the patients experienced, nor does it capture the appropriate physiology of what's going on in the body. Um, so for me, when I hear adrenal fatigue, I think I need to find out more. Dr. Mueller has published a paper explaining how endocrinologists should be more understanding of patients who come to them with adrenal fatigue. Her approach to the condition is that it is not the adrenals that are the issue, but rather that the problem is in the brain, which is sending improper signals to the adrenals and other hormone-producing glands. As the hypothalamus sends signals to the pituitary gland, and the pituitary gland sends signals throughout the body. It sends signals to the thyroid, to the adrenals, to the testes, to the ovaries, to the liver. So oftentimes when patients say the term adrenal fatigue, I understand what they mean, but to call it adrenal fatigue is already a challenge because the changes that are going on are not related to the adrenal glands. They're related to the brain and how the brain copes with repeated stress. And there's changes in the brain that affect how we cope with stress signaling. And that's probably the underlying defect. I think many medical doctors set out, they truly want to help people. They want to help people get better. And the solutions to any of the diagnosis that medical doctors learn about are medications. So they're really not taught nutrition. They're not taught lifestyle solutions. They're not, they don't learn about supplements and they don't learn about natural solutions. So the doctors are lacking the tools. They don't have the tools to help patients make behavior changes. They don't have the resources available to them because they're confined by 15 minute visits governed by insurance companies. And they have patients that come in that, that are giving pushback that are arguing and saying, well, I don't, I don't really eat that bad. I really don't need to do this. So there's that confrontation and doctors that just get burnt out and say, I don't want to argue with anymore. That's fine. Do what you want. Just take these meds, come back in six months and they'll sign off on the chart. Western medicine uh, does some things very well, like if you're having a heart attack, if you're uh, having a stroke, if you're, um, you know, you break your leg, you, you need a surgery done. But with chronic disease, the, the, the idea that a medication that blocks processes can give you a good result in the long term, it, it just doesn't make any sense. And when they go in to see their doctors, they're written off. 
they're kind of told, well, what do you want? Your thyroid labs look good. Uh, they don't test for cortisol, and if they do test, it's this one-time blood test that they do, and it looks normal to them. As we've gotten, I would just argue, sicker as a species, you can see that lab ranges have changed to basically keep normative value. If you look at the, the lab values in most tests today, you would see that they're much more forgiving today in, in so many ways. And so you have people that have these varying degrees of you know, dysfunction, but because the lab ranges say it's okay, you know, typically our doctors are gonna say, oh no, you're fine, the lab says it's normal. So there's a challenge with hormonal testing in general. So first off, the ranges are really large. And part of that is because the way the assays were developed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, you take a, a whole population, sample them, and then come up with a normal distribution curve. And you can imagine that hormone testing is just a snapshot in time. Our hormones are constantly changing. You, you have these extremes that the general medicine population is used to diagnosing, and if you don't fit within those labs, then they say you don't have anything wrong with you. So testing for adrenal fatigue, I think it's really in the Stone Ages. I don't think that there's one test that I would say this is the test you need, because it's so much more complicated than that. Yeah, there's a lot of frustration when doctors don't have answers. And you have to appreciate uh, for the traditional uh, allopathic doctor, their lens is diagnosis and treatment, and typically that treatment comes from a chemical, a pharmaceutical, if not a surgical intervention. If traditional blood work's not looking at different functional markers that we now are aware of inside of the body, then a lot of these what we call subclinical cases don't fit into a category. And if they don't fit into a category, it's hard for a traditional doctor to diagnose somebody and then use their given treatment protocols. The adrenal glands are hormone-producing organs that sit above the kidney, hence the term adrenal, meaning next to the kidney. They produce hormones that have a range of activity throughout our body. Cortisol is released as an awakening response, which is why it normally is highest in the AM and drops to its lowest when it is time to sleep. It is also released in times of stress to suppress bodily functions that are not needed, such as the immune system and digestion, and increase the functions that are needed for optimum brain glucose and tissue repair. Prolonged high levels of cortisol are damaging to the body, while low levels can result in low energy. Aldosterone is involved with regulation of sodium and affects blood pressure. Low aldosterone can result in low blood sugar and low blood pressure. Adrenaline and noradrenaline are released during the fight or flight stress response and increase heart rate, blood pressure, and blood sugar levels. The adrenals also release sex hormones like DHEA, progesterone, testosterone, and estrogen. The adrenals are not the only source of these. The ovaries and testes also release them. The HPA axis is what controls the hormonal signals to the adrenal gland. The way it works is that when your body encounters any kind of emotional, chemical, physical stressor, your body is amazing. It says, hey, I need to respond accordingly. The HPA axis is comprised of the hypothalamus, the pituitary gland, and the adrenal glands. The hypothalamus is often referred to as a master control center, which keeps the entire body regulated. It responds to signals to regulate hormones in the body to help us wake up, to sleep, respond to stress, maintain blood pressure, and many other things. The pituitary gland responds to signals from the hypothalamus to control the thyroid, the sex organs, and the adrenal gland. The adrenals release cortisol as instructed to by the pituitary gland. In the fight or flight stress response, the adrenals release adrenaline first, followed by cortisol. The adrenals used to be called the second brain, and this is because they are hardwired with so many nerves. I was riding my bicycle down a sidewalk as a child, and there was a near miss, and a truck had come down out of an alley. It was a blinded alley, and right there, you know, the brakes screech, and I realized that my body had moved. I literally 
had risen up on my bike and gotten to safety, I never thought about it. I didn't know what was coming. My body just reacted. So our nervous system has two states. There is the sympathetic, which is our adrenaline fight or flight. And we need this state, again, to just get through that stressful experience. But we need to come down from it. So we should be here maybe 2% of the time. And then we have our parasympathetic state. This is where the magic happens. We digest here, we're resting, we're regenerating, and we need to be here 98% of the time. I think chronic fatigue syndrome is the label that most people get first. Oh, you're tired all the time. Chronic fatigue syndrome, very broad blanket. Adrenal fatigue is typically uh, a more specific diagnosis once they identify that you've had a lot of stress in your life and then now we're going to diagnose you a little more specifically, which by the way, gives people a little more hope oftentimes because ah, it's the adrenals. But as we discussed, it can be a false hope <laughs> because you know the adrenals themselves are just part of the problem. Adrenal fatigue is not the same as chronic fatigue syndrome. Not all of my patients with adrenal fatigue meet all the criteria for having chronic fatigue syndrome. And it's also waxing and waning in a way that chronic fatigue syndrome isn't, right? Chronic fatigue syndrome, many times patients are really incapacitated due to their severe, severe fatigue. Um, with adrenal fatigue, I'll see patients that have, you know, months that are better and then months that are lower in terms of their energy. And it's really more cyclic and episodic and related to stressors or traumatic events. Um, when you're talking about chronic fatigue, you're talking about kind of specific features of fatigue. And there's a significant component of muscle weakness as well. Um, and I feel that most of my patients with adrenal fatigue don't necessarily have that severity of muscle weakness. There is a significant overlap in the symptoms between chronic fatigue syndrome and adrenal fatigue, including fatigue unrelieved by rest and heart palpitations. However, there are also very specific symptoms that tend to occur with adrenal fatigue that do not occur with chronic fatigue syndrome, such as being tired and wired, and having your energy cycle inverted, being very tired during daylight hours, yet having more vitality at late night hours. I think some of the best practitioners today are ones that have been ill before, they've had adrenal fatigue, they've had chronic fatigue in some form, and they went on their own healing journey, their own search for answers, their own search for the underlying root cause. In that situation, I felt exactly like my patients who come in to see me because I feel terrible, but my lab values tell me that there's nothing wrong hormonally. And I'm an endocrinologist, and I was an endocrinologist, grown up after fellowship doctor <laughs> when this happened. And in that situation, I feel like the only alternative I had was to do my own research, which is what patients do. I think the difference that I had compared to some of my patients is that as a physician, I knew where to look. Adrenal fatigue was a huge part of what I battled myself. I didn't know it was wrong, uh, probably like so many people watching this. And, and it started with fatigue, where I just, I was probably in the best shape of my life. I was an expert cyclist. I couldn't even, from being able to ride 100 miles, I couldn't ride five, wiped out. And then I took 10 days off. That's when the anxiety started. And that's when the insomnia started. Then I became literally allergic to everything that I was eating. Unknowingly, I thought it was food allergies. I thought it was this, and it was getting worse, not better. I became you know, someone I didn't even know anymore. I couldn't even handle the kids crying. I couldn't adapt to that at all. My hair started thinning, my skin was dry. But yet my thyroid blood work was normal, but I knew my thyroid and my adrenals, that whole system was not working right. Almost every test that I did came back normal. And that was devastating too, because that's when the doctor looks at you and says it's all in your head basically, and you know, you'll be fine. Just you know, eliminate some stress in your life, you'll be fine. 
<laughs> it's like, you don't understand. In fact, when I started this, I was still horribly sick and non-functional. In my early 20s, something happened and I just crashed. I mean, just crashed. I, I went into a, a terrible tailspin. <laughs> so things I thought were right for me nutritionally, knowing what I know now, I look back and go, oh, that was like the worst thing I could have done, right? And I actually had these conditions still there, but what I was doing sent me into a tailspin as well. And that was when it got really bad. I was losing weight uncontrollably. I was having panic attacks, complete insomnia. I couldn't sleep at all. Um, it was it was terrible. I, I, I thought I was going to die. The infections all flared up. Everything flared up. I it, it was food was reacting. My heart was beating so much all the time. It felt like a, like a baby was punching me inside my chest. But doctors couldn't figure out what was wrong with me. So I eventually kept trying other nutritional things, and I found the information on the technology that I use, which is using a particular way of analyzing a hair test and nutrition for that. And it's interesting, that worked. I started that and started climbing out of the hole, but it took a really long time. Another thing that I find, and it was true for me, is that when you can learn it that well and help others, it helps you. There's something healing about that. Life is, is, is full of difficulties. Um, I met someone that I thought I was going to marry. Everything seemed perfect. One day, she was supposed to come visit me, and instead, she left the country and never spoke to me again. And I don't, and I never found out what happened. I never heard from her. I didn't really, her family told me not to talk to them anymore. She was just gone. It was like she died in a way because she's totally removed from my life and I can't ask her why or anything. I was unable to sleep. My heart would pound so hard in my chest and I would lay there in bed and it would literally shake the bed. My heartbeat would shake the bed from how powerful it was and I would not sleep at all. By this point, they're not sleeping. They're anxious. The body is in a, is locked in to a fight or flight mode. So they're, they're stuck, a sympathetic, Fight or flight nervous system is on all the time. Three or four days of not sleeping, I ended up starting to hallucinate. And I decided that I needed to go to the hospital. They had to give me two medications together to get me to be able to sleep. Some things happened to me. I think, I, I think people don't realize how powerful trauma can affect you. My sleep was so wrecked uh, that even though I took the medication, every night before I went to sleep, I had basically what you describe as a panic attack and it was very strange because I would I would know when it was going to happen it would be right when my brain started to transition into sleep it was very predictable every time and I would feel this wave of terror start at my feet and just wash up over my whole body but that was my my life for another 6 months or so it took me a while to recover once I started recovering I realized I was getting really tired a lot and I thought it was just withdrawal from the various medications but I would get so tired that I couldn't you know I, I was single and I couldn't clean my apartment so I was actually hiring a cleaning lady to come and I, I remember feeling so guilty because I'm laying on the couch and this woman is cleaning my apartment for me because I can't do it I can barely stand up but I didn't think I didn't again I didn't know anything was wrong I thought I just kind of had a a breakdown and, and I had sleep problems. I was just staying alive. I was just working and I was miserable. I never felt happy. And uh, I remember about six months later, I was outside and I looked up at the sun and I felt a tiny shred of happiness. And I was like, oh, I remember this. I guess maybe I'm gonna be okay. And, and I, I, you know, from that moment, I started feeling better. And, and that really kind of led to my decision uh, to, to leave where I was. I was in North Carolina and I decided to move to Los Angeles because I had lost almost all my friends. They thought I went crazy because before I was pretty stable and then this thing happened to me and I looked you know, like a crazy person, I guess, to them. That's, that's what it seemed like. So I understand that sometimes you can you, you lose your friends uh, over this sort of thing. When I say the word stress, or if someone says adrenal fatigue and how it relates to stress, 
we typically only think about the emotional stress. There are three sources, emotional, physical, and chemical. So emotional stress is the stuff we think about, but physical stress is everything we do to our body. What positions do you sleep in? Do you exercise? Do you exercise enough? Do you exercise too much? Everything we do to our body physically gets put into the physical stress, and then everything we put inside of our body gets added to our chemical stress. So are we taking vitamins? That could be maybe a good stress. Or are we eating fast food? That would be a negative stress. Literally, every single thing that comes up in our life during any course of any day can get put into one of those three categories of emotional, physical, or chemical, and is either helping us over time or hurting us over time. Physical stressors on the body include working too hard, dealing with an illness such as a virus or infection, and exercising too much. Many people get more exercise than they need while not getting enough sleep. Problem there is people overexercise when they're burned out and they get a little bit of a stimulant boost from that, but they're running themselves down even more. Running this company, doing that, you know, sleeps four hours a night. It's the person who is running life, a type A personality, running life from every direction. Emotional stressors consist of any emotionally traumatic event a person experiences. Some of these happen suddenly, and some are repeated over time. Struggling for years financially or in an abusive relationship can take a toll on the body. Often the underlying root cause is a trauma of some kind. Um, sometimes that's recognized like a big trauma, like you can imagine attack, assault, whatever you might think of as traumatic, but sometimes it can be minor traumas. So whatever it is, I, when I think of adrenal fatigue, I think of someone who has really had stress impact their body in a negative way. Maybe they have a stressful job that they have really hated for years, a decade, something like that. Maybe they've been taking care of um, a family member who has had a chronic illness. Um, or it could be an acute stressful situation, something like an accident happening. Our environment today is full of toxins from decades of industrialization. This includes toxic metals and pesticides. The soil we grow food in and our water are often contaminated. Without proper supervision, people can take supplements that they don't need because they saw something in an infomercial. Alcohol and drugs stress the body. Every day, the body is exposed to chemical stressors. The World Health Organization has found we have 500 to 700 chemicals in our bloodstream. This is a massive stressor that many mainstream medical doctors are not looking at. One of the main underlying root causes of adrenal fatigue is heavy metals. So we've all heard of mercury and lead, but there's other metals like arsenic, tin, thallium, cesium, and aluminum. These metals poison enzymes that produce our sex hormones and stress hormones like cortisol every step of the way. But these toxic metals also poison our mitochondria that produce our body's energy, producing fatigue. Stress, environment, diet, lack of exercise, um, thoughts, all these things we know can, can dictate inflammation and either turn on chronic disease or turn off chronic disease. So we can, we can look at those in the subcategories and we can say, okay, how much of that is influenced by the diet? Well, that's, that's huge, right? I think we've become a society that relies so much on convenience foods that we're starting to lose sight of you know, where the food originates from. Convenience foods can be great, but they come at a cost because you don't have control over how they're prepared. You don't have control over what other ingredients are put in there. Usually, I mean, there are exceptions to this. A person can go and get you know, poisoned overnight or they can go through something horribly traumatic, right? But when there's not an obvious cause, chances are it wasn't all of a sudden. And chances are what's happened is that there has been a slow decline that the body has been compensating for. And it's been taking from here and shoving over there and shifting and maneuvering to keep you going and keep you from feeling that anything is wrong. And eventually the body stops being able to compensate. The three things, hidden infections, mold and heavy metals. I would say those are the three things that are stressors that most people don't consider, but could be the very thing causing why they still don't feel well. I decided to start a new life. I had been a computer guy. 
but I'd always loved acting and music, and I thought, I'm gonna have an adventure. I'm gonna move to LA before I'm too old and be an actor and find out what happens out there. But when I'd first got there, it hadn't been too long. I'd only been there about a year, and my sister suddenly died uh, from MRSA. And if you're not familiar with that, it's a strain of staph infection bacteria that's immune to antibiotics. It was through her entire body, and there was no way to save her. I remember I was in California, and uh, I, I was trying to get a flight back because they said she was really bad, and it was Easter weekend and spring break, and there was no flights, uh, but she died the day before. Uh, for my, my flight was available. No one expected her to suddenly die. And it, was, it was quite a shock uh, to, to all of us, and I'm sure to my mom especially. But, um, you know, my sister was gone, and, and I, it, 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 it was hard to deal with. And that, that you know, hurt me for a while. And um, about nine months later, my dad suddenly died. And uh, he... He basically smoked himself to death. He didn't deteriorate, he just suddenly died. He very suddenly died uh, from it. And um, so I'd lost my dad and my sister within the this, this span of a year. And, and that entire year, pretty much 2010, so I would say this was sort of my second crash. It hit me really hard, I remember. And it's funny, because at the time, I was doing this exercise program where you're working out really intensely all the time, and I was in super good shape. And I remember I was still trying to do it, while this all was going on with my dad, I think between the stress, of the physical stress of my intense training that I was doing, plus the, the mental stress of my dad dying, uh, it was a lot on my body. And I didn't realize it yet. There were subtle things going on. I'd be dizzy sometimes, and I, I had weird sleep again. My sleep was always affected first. But a friend of mine, Tara, was making the film in Florida, and I do sword fighting. So she invited me to come do sword fighting in the film to be a, basically a bad guy. And so there's some scenes you can see of me. I get beat up three times, basically, in the movie. Uh, and uh, it's pretty fun. There's some fun scenes there. During the shoot, I actually met uh, a nice girl out there, uh, Kelly, and we started dating. Then Kelly came to visit me, and we, we decided to drive to Vegas. It's not too far from LA. We went there and we had a great time. I had a great time with Kelly in Vegas. But what happened out there is I didn't think about this. Of course, today, certainly I would, but I touched everything. I was touching all these slot machines and games and everywhere I went and all these casinos, touching everything. And I got a terrible flu. And when we got back, I was, I was really sick. I was already pretty weak because of the mental stress of my family dying and the, the physical stress from the intense workouts that I'd been doing. I didn't really recover from the flu. Um, imagine having the flu and how tired you are and how you want to be in bed all the time. And that's how tired I was, but I didn't have a sore throat or runny nose or anything, but I stayed that tired all the time and it didn't go away. It's not just one stressor. Typically, it's what I call the perfect storm. So the person who develops adrenal fatigue is the guy or woman who gets hit with the perfect storm, meaning you have three stressors that come together. It could be physical, chemical, or emotional. You know, people think they should just roll with the punches. And after, you know, multiple times of kind of getting beat down by life, people can develop severe fatigue. And oftentimes what I see in my patients with adrenal fatigue is that they have had this same pattern of repeated insults or traumas. And I, have to, I can see it in their eyes where they're tired. Not just tired like I want to go to sleep. Tired. Tired to the point where you see it in their eyes. And I have to say, this is hard. I eventually got so tired that Kelly would call my girlfriend and I wouldn't be able to talk on the phone. I would be too tired to have a phone conversation. And this happened enough times over the next month or two that, that Kelly broke up with me because there was nothing there for her, right? I, I was in bed all the time. The scary thing for me was I was too tired to care. I was so tired I could only take walks. And I, so I'd walk around and my heart would pound all the time. I'd be exhausted, my heart would pound so hard. I, I started going to all these doctors. I went to a regular doctor and she tested me for everything, which 
which is pretty normal how this goes for most people, right? They test you for everything, nothing. Blood work was fine, no viruses, and there was nothing. And at that point, when they've kind of ruled out everything and you've had the, the fatigue for several months, they say, well, you fit the, the conditions for chronic fatigue syndrome. So she officially diagnosed me in 2010. And there's not much you can do with that, though. When you get diagnosed with chronic fatigue syndrome, that's, that's it. You, okay, go and do your best, right? There's no medical treatments, really. I didn't have any family to move in with that had space for me that could take care of me. And so I didn't know what I was going to do. And I remember I was praying and I said, you know, is this it? Is this my life? Just the rest of my life? Am I going to feel like this? Somebody's going to have to take care of me and I won't be able to take care of myself. And I heard this voice, a clear voice in my head that said, that is not your fate. And so I d decided to believe that. I, I read a lot. And so I, was, I would go to the used bookstore to read because that wasn't too hard to do. And when I was there, I saw a book kind of sticking out of the shelf and it said adrenal fatigue. And I thought, what is that? That looks interesting. And it kind of stuck out to me like I was supposed to get it. And so I grabbed it and I started reading it. And I matched all of the symptoms for this. And in the book, it mentions that for extreme cases of adrenal fatigue, you can get hormone replacement therapy. And so I, I took the book, I went to a doctor in Santa Monica and I said, I think I have this, uh, I want to get hydrocortisone supplements. And he talked to me a little bit, said, all right, let's give it a try. So I started taking hydrocortisone in small doses. The second crash took me a year to recover from. I was doing meditation and qigong and anything else I read that could help. The hydrocortisone supplements seemed to be working. Though, from what I have learned, they should only be used in extreme cases. Eventually, things started looking better in my life, and I was mostly recovered. People have gone through it. They're not crazy. They're not lazy. They, have, they haven't lost the desire to do things. They've just been incapacitated by something that, 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 that for through no fault of their own. And you have to understand that they're not just a lazy bum sitting at home uh, collecting welfare checks. That's just not who they are. And we tend, to, we tend in our society to be label people way too easily. One of the problems with this is because it's not medically fully recognized, people who are undergoing this or experiencing it, they often have family or friends who don't understand, haven't been through it themselves, and don't even fully believe that it's happening or think it's in their heads, right? And I've seen this take a huge toll on relationships. It's ended friendships, I mean, massively. I, I've had people lose all their friends over something like this uh, because people think they're a hypochondriac or people think they're, they're crazy or lazy or make any other negative association with it because those people haven't been through it. And again, it's not medically recognized. Uh, so in France, uh, I can write a prescription, if I was a physician there, uh, write a prescription for three months on the beach and the government will cover your salary while you recover on the beach. Whereas, of course, here in North America, when you're not working, you may be only getting a fraction of your salary if you're earning anything at all. The American life is designed around having a 40-hour week job. And so when you can't do that, when you can only work part-time or an unusual job, you're not going to get benefits, you're going to make less money, and to, you're still expected to survive as an adult. And so it's really hard if you're sort of like us, where you're partially disabled, but not completely. You know, you just can't do as much as uh, the average person. And that overwhelming stress of the financial burden impairs your ability to heal. And I ran like $5,000 worth of tests, none of it which was covered under insurance. And, you know, at this point, I don't know how much you know, money I was going through. My, my wife and I, in the end, estimated somewhere around $200,000, okay? We didn't have it, right? I mean, just, you know, we were remortgaging our home, but I was going to do anything it took to get uh, my life back. And I've seen patients, you know, really pay out of pocket and, and struggle financially because they've put all of their hopes on getting better from this one treatment. A lot of these people with adrenal fatigue, it's this internal struggle, it's like this internal suffering 
that only maybe the people closest to them might, might know about, but everyone around them expects them to be just fine. You know, there's that anxiety there that's like, that's overwhelming, that inability to like handle things. What happens is when we're in this stress mode, this fight or flight for a long enough period of time, you really start to hardwire it. Our nervous system works in a way that the more we light up a certain pathway, the more ingrained that pathway becomes. They just get thicker and more ingrained, and then they just become habitual, and they just start to light up all the time. They get into this state of just not being able to experience life. They're getting into a state where getting out of bed is a challenge, where having a relationship is a challenge. And when that's happening, you're going in this downward spiral. So what happened after I started getting better from taking the hydrocortisone, I thought, well, I don't understand this. I don't know why it happened to me. Who knows when this could come back? It could happen again. So I decided to hurry up. I wanted to star in a film. So I got my friends together. I grabbed the biggest actors that I knew and we started to write the film Altered Spirits. And I found a good director because I wanted to star in it. I didn't want to direct it. And I wrote it with my roommate and we started filming. I remember being on set for Altered Spirits and I would run literally from shooting location to shooting location. I think I was sort of reveling in the energy that I'd recovered. Everybody saw me. They would just, there's Steve running again. There's Steve running. Even though in the back of my head, I was like, I don't know if this could happen again, but for right now, it's not. I remember there was a scene, it's a, it's a sci-fi movie and my girlfriend has been sort of kidnapped by this evil spirit and I'm running after her through the desert and I'm probably running at least 100 meters. They just have me run, 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 run and the, and the trucks follow me and then we finish it and the director's like, all right, let's do it again and he drives the truck back and he just wants me to run back and then run and do it again and we did this like five times in a row so I ran like a thousand meters in a few minutes and I was fine. I was actually able to do it. It's like 80, 90 degrees out in the desert. So I, I was really almost pushing it because I, I felt like, is this real? Am I really better? Eventually we, we finished shooting and it was around uh, 2011 we shot this. I was finally feeling better after being in bed basically all of 2010. We're getting, we got a rough cut. Uh, my director Peter is, is starting to meet people to get distribution, to, to get them to decide to take our film and put it out on the market. At the same time, it's 2013 now, so it's been a couple years since we did the shooting. And I decided, for some reason, that I wanted to do bodybuilding. That I wanted to be an actor, but I wanted to play superhero roles. I wanted to be the hero character, and so I, I had some money and some time and I hired a trainer and I started pounding protein shakes and I put on like 15 pounds of muscle. Some strange things started happening to me. My sleep was getting interrupted. I would wake up after three or four hours of sleep and have a really hard time getting back to sleep. And I started to have stabbing pains in my kidneys, which if you think about it, it was probably dumb that I didn't do anything about it. But then, then things happened. Uh, I'd, I'd met a nice girl that I was dating and everything seemed to be going really well with her. <laughs> um, and then things went very badly very quickly with her. And then she was gone. And it immediately went to my sleep again. And, and I already was having trouble sleeping, so now it was even worse. The things got pretty bad, but I only felt good really when I was at the gym. So I was still going to the gym like six days a week, but I wasn't sleeping. So I started losing more and more weight. Steve lost a lot of weight, a lot. His clothes were baggy and was starting to look anorexic. Uh, um, you could really see it in his face the most. Um, like all of his, his facial features got really defined and really prominent. Uh, and I was at 7% body fat because I, I was sleeping less and less every night. And probably, I'm not sure if this was the most horrible thing, but it's pretty close. I mean, after I would sleep two or three hours, I would get these almost shocks in my brain. And it wasn't like an electric shock, it was more like a panic shock. Like an explosion went off. Something horrible happened and I would wake up 
very suddenly from sleep. But I'd be so exhausted that I would fall back asleep almost instantly. And then five minutes later, it would happen again. And this would happen every five minutes for the next five or six hours. So when you're in that hyped up state, you're actually producing too much adrenaline and oftentimes too much cortisol at the wrong time. So you wake up at four in the morning, that could either be too much adrenaline or cortisol, pushing up glucose because your adrenals get so wiped out at some point during the night. And by the way, one of their jobs is simply supplying uh, the brain with glucose. Glucose can drop and it has to rise up the cortisol literally to save your life. And that's why you're up in the middle of the night in this hyper state. I would not get to sleep any more than five minutes at a time. And I started going to doctors again. I had an HMO. I said, I think this might be related to adrenal fatigue. But the doctor didn't believe there was such a thing as adrenal fatigue. <laughs> he tested everything. Nothing was wrong. I told him I was really doing bad. I wasn't sleeping. I couldn't sleep. I got to the point where I didn't even try to sleep more than two or three hours. Once I started having what I called the sleep jerks, waking up suddenly over and over again. It was just like a huge shot of adrenaline, like an explosion went off next to your head every five minutes. So I gave up on sleeping. So I would, I would go sit in a chair and I would meditate for the next five or six hours until dawn. And I wasn't sleeping and I wasn't sleeping. And I started going to alternative medicine doctors and they gave me all kinds of different supplements. And soon I had a box full of 50 or 60 different supplements. And what was happening is because I wasn't sleeping as I was no longer thinking clearly and I was still living alone and I didn't have anyone to really speak into my life, I was taking dozens of supplements every day. And I was probably throwing my body chemistry way out of whack further than it was. And, but nothing would make me sleep. There was nothing, even the prescription that I had before was not making me sleep. And then I remembered before I'd taken some cortisol, right? I was on cortisol. And so I, I got some cortisol. I went to a doctor and I said, I used to take this and it was helping me and, you know, convinced the doctor to give me some cortisol. I started taking that and it just made things worse. I remember I was driving home from a doctor and I started to have a panic attack. And I was, I was pounding the steering wheel with anger, going, why is this happening to me? What is happening to my body? I don't even understand. You know, all of a sudden you're feeling good, you're going along with your life, and everything starts to fall. You know, you kind of feel like, I've had patients tell me that they feel like they're going crazy, and they don't know why. I didn't know what was wrong with me, and I got worse and worse because I was getting afraid all the time. I was starting to feel fear. The world didn't feel real. And I would have these fatigue episodes. I remember I would, when I'd get up, because I hadn't slept and everything, and I would try to take a shower and I'd be holding on to the shower curtain just to stand up. But one day I, and I took this supplement and it caused a reaction. Fortunately, one of my friends was staying with me at the time, Tara, my friend who I was in the film with in Florida, my friend who made the film. She was there with me that evening I had a six hour panic attack. Uh, it did not stop. My heart felt like it was going to burst out of my chest. And something happened to my body chemistry after that. I was afraid all the time. I was afraid of everything. Any movement, if I saw a person walking outside, if I saw them come into my field of view, I would get afraid. If I, if I got cold, sudden temperatures would cause me to feel fear. Tara obviously knew something was very wrong with me and so she took me to the hospital. All right, so, so there was about a week where I stayed with Steve and he, he needed some assistance. So uh, there were doctor's appointments that I took him to. The doctors were like, well, we don't have any tests that say anything, but we need to get you some sleep. So they sent me to a psych doctor and the psych doctor had to give me three medications to sleep. I didn't even know if it was gonna work, but I remember they gave me three medications and I took all three of them. And I was laying there going, this isn't gonna work. And then finally I fell asleep, but I was still waking up after only five or six hours and still being afraid all the time. In my you know, understanding of things and my experience of it, when a person can't sleep, that's kind of the bottom rung. And it's ironic because that's exactly what you need to get better and you can't sleep. I went from mostly functioning normal human being to being afraid of everything in the world. 
I, I, I couldn't watch regular television anymore. I couldn't, I had, I only watched cartoons. In fact, for the six, next six months, I only watched cartoons because they didn't scare me. I've either been extremely anxious, my body just floods me with adrenaline, just floods me with it. <clears throat> um, or I get, uh, you know, I get a, a, a severe depression. And I know it's not normally how I am. If you know me, I'm not a sad person. I'm a very happy and silly person. And I think the hardest part about all that was that it never stopped. There was never a break from being afraid. I would be afraid every moment I was awake, and then while I was asleep, I would still feel it was there. Underneath all the drugs, I would feel the fear. And I knew it wasn't rational, and I knew it wasn't just a mental problem. I could feel something in my body was causing this. When we talk about some of the symptoms, I couldn't, I got so bad, I couldn't even adapt to sound. Anything exciting, I couldn't even watch a football game, I'd have to leave. But I couldn't watch even sports anymore. I would feel scared watching sports. But eventually during that time, I, I, a friend of mine directed me to a nutritionist named Nikki. And Nikki did, did a hair mineral analysis. She did a hair test on me. He had been struggling with this for a long time. And that this was a multifaceted problem um, I could see that he was tired. I could see that he was frustrated, um, nervous, scared, unsure about what was going to work, um, maybe losing a little hope. And she said, look, you have adrenal fatigue, but you also have metal toxicity, heavy metal toxicity. There's a whole balance of vitamins and minerals and, and what's just right for that person's body chemistry. And it's gonna be different. Two people can have adrenal fatigue but because of differences in the body chemistry, you might have two completely different approaches to fixing it. With Steve, we had, we had indicators that there was copper building up in the body. And this copper will cause things like anxiety, depression, insomnia, headaches, uh, all kinds of problems can come up with that. I would have done anything Nikki told me to do, right? I'd already gone to a couple other practitioners who had made me worse. You know, as a practitioner, I find that people come to me. Many of them are willing to do anything by the time they get to me. And Nikki put me on an all-natural diet, no sugar, no wheat, um, no chemicals, right, no processed foods. I was just eating mostly meat and vegetables. I just had to believe what she said was true because I didn't see any changes for several weeks. And I was miserable. I started to have these fatigue spells and I could feel them coming on, where I could feel my whole body system sort of shutting down in terms of energy. And I would have to hurry up and get in bed because I would not be able to move for like another hour or two. I couldn't sleep. I could not sleep without the medication because if I tried to take a nap or sleep during the day without the medication, I would have terrifying nightmares. Just the most realistic, horrific nightmares you could have. I could never take naps. It was not an option. I could hold myself together for the two to three hours when I would teach, but then that would be it. I would go home and crash. I was going and buying groceries. I remember I, could, I was so weak I could barely carry the, the 24 pack of water up the stairs. I would get to the top of the stairs and I would almost collapse and my head would be pounding and I'd be in pain and my heart would be pounding. Uh, another thing that started happening is the extreme headaches I would get. The incredible pain. And they would, it would hurt so bad that I couldn't move. Sometimes they would last 16 hours. I got muscle twitches. My face started twitching. Usually one of my eyes would stop working. It would just stop focusing. So I'd go through a whole day with only one of my eyes working. And I had ringing in my ears. I was urinating all the time. I had digestive problems. Uh, and I had yellow stool. The fight or flight response, when that's on all the time, one of the things that shuts down is digestion. And so you don't digest very well. So you become malnourished. You can't keep up. Like, you're anxious, you're depressed, you feel alone, but in the midst of all of that, you're living inside of your body in a body that you feel like you can't control, in a body that's tired, in a mind that's anxious and depressed. And I remember I would get home from work at the end of the day, it'd be around six or seven, and I'd have dinner, and I so looked forward to watching Batman Beyond. That was my thing that, the only thing I looked forward to in my entire day. You're going in this downward spiral where, again, your self-worth you know, you're not seeing yourself as someone that can live or even is worth this experience that we have in this human body. The night I came over and I could tell he was upset, 
and had probably been crying and things like that. And Steve literally asked me while I was there what I would do or what our friends would do if he killed himself. And he meant it. And that one was pretty scary. Um, and I told him we'd be really mad at him <laughs> and we wouldn't forgive him and that he needed to stick around and he needed to get better. Honestly, my mom is, is the reason that I'm still alive because you know, it was only me and my sister were the only kids. And once she lost my sister, Julie, I could not bear to think of my mom losing both of her children. And that's what kept me alive. Because for that first six months, I wanted to die every single day. But it took, it took several years this time to get better. The six, first six months were the worst. And then I slowly, slowly crawled my way out of it. Uh, I, I kept going to Nikki. I kept taking my supplements. I kept doing my diet. I kept sleeping. I slowly weaned myself off of all the medication I was taking. Again, it took, it was about two years when I started to kind of feel a little bit better, but I still, I didn't really enjoy life. They go in search of treatments to deal with one symptom or two symptoms that are listed online that don't necessarily get to the root cause of the problem. So then they start chasing for more symptoms that might lead to treatments that cause more side effects. And then they're in this vicious cycle of looking for answers, getting a treatment, not feeling better, and then re-hunting for answers. I can say this. I've dealt with clients and patients who are completely wiped out. The worst adrenal fatigue you could possibly imagine. And when you get to the up root cause, it's remarkable. They become balanced again with the whole hormonal system. So it's not about rebuilding an adrenal as I thought and many people thought. It's really about you get to removing these causes you know, and the body becomes balanced again, homeostasis. So you get upstream, you remove the cause, the balance can come quickly. That should give people hope. So my biggest resource when, I, when I'm dealing with these areas is I, I deal with naturopaths. I find that naturopaths really do look at the whole body and how it's working with each other, and they're much more functional in their approach. What I would suggest is finding a provider or a practitioner that's, that's a functional medicine practitioner or someone that's naturally based that will, will take 30 to 90 minutes on your initial intake with you and, 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 really, and really is getting to the behavioral component and teaching you how to really work on yourself. First, you want to look for functional practitioners. You want to look for functional medicine practitioners. You want to look for DCs, doctors of chiropractic. They have more training in nutrition and how the body works. In functional medicine, you're looking for dysfunction and you're trying to intervene before we actually have all the consequences associated with that disorder. So functional medicine is really all about getting down to the root of the problem. So it's really, you know, taking a patient, looking at them, you know, looking at their symptoms, looking at their lifestyle, um, looking at really what is impacting them in a negative way and figuring out what the root of that is. You know, I think so much of the time in conventional medicine, we look at what the symptom is, you know, oh, you're not sleeping well. Well, let's give you a, a, a medicine to help you sleep. Oh, you know, you're having, um, you're having acid reflux. Well, let's give you some Tums, you know, are anxious. Let's give you an antidepressant or an anti-anxiety medication. I mean, we're really all about treating the symptoms and it just, it doesn't make any sense logically to do that. You know, you've really got to look at what is going on globally, you know, what is really at the root of all of these symptoms because nothing, our body is not in pieces. Every single thing is connected. I think with, the, with what we call the holistic model, we're, we're looking at the body as not being a separate 
component than our minds and our hearts, or if we want to go into religious areas of soul and or, or spirit. And so we, we find that in uh, right now at the level that modern medicine is at, it's been uh, called uh, man in the test tube. Everything is fragmented down to little tiny manageable parts. More important than anything is you need to find a practitioner that's willing to listen. They're coming to you looking for help. So first and foremost, our job is to listen. And I think, again, we're so wrapped up in just trying to find an answer with a number and a code that we forget about the person that we're talking to. And it's a, it's a, it's more than a one-way relationship of me just telling you what to do. You're trying to give me information and I need to do my best to listen to everything that you said and support you and support your systems. So I think part of the way that I really address treating a patient as a whole person is you know, the interview process, spending time with the patient, kind of figuring out, you know, what's all going on from head to toe. And then, you know, really addressing all of those things through labs. So you can have a patient who has, for example, talking about thyroid, a T3 of 3.4, and another patient who has the exact same T3 of 3.4, and this patient feels great, and this patient still feels tired. So you really have to address the patient and treat the patient based on how they feel and not just what the numbers show. And in that instance, I would rather treat the patient in front of me than a lab test. Through all the doctors I've talked to and through all the years I've researched on my own, I've discovered there are different types of ways to improve overall health. I have personally practiced some of the methods from each one of these categories and seen their effectiveness. If you start to look at some of the foods that we eat, they're not really a food like a carrot that you could pull out of the ground or, you know, even an animal that we might slaughter to eat. They're things that are manufactured in a laboratory somewhere. They're, you know, combinations of ingredients that are put together to create some food product. What we've been talking about and thinking about has been this concept of, well, maybe some of these manufactured foods that are highly processed are more drug-like than food-like. A lot of people who eat a poor diet or eat a diet that's rich in highly processed foods and lots of sugars, you know, they comment that once they stop eating that way, they suddenly have all this energy. Vegetables, really important. We need to eat vegetables. Um, we need to eat not just raw vegetables, we need to eat cooked vegetables. Um, because when you cook vegetables, you're breaking down the fiber, it makes them easier to digest. A variety of vegetables, mostly cooked, some raw is fine, and protein. We need meat. Sorry to say it, but we need meat. We, we are not historically vegetarians or vegans. That is not how, how man has, has evolved. Even just eggs, if they won't do meat. Um, that these, the proteins and the way the proteins are, are, exist in, the, in animal foods um, is extremely nourishing to the body. But something that, you know, you can recognize where it came from. I think we've become a society that relies so much on convenience foods. So trying to focus on having wholesome foods that are actual foods, not necessarily processed foods that were manufactured in a laboratory somewhere, is a good way to go. What we've seen over the past, I'd say, 50 years or so is that the amount of sugar that Americans are consuming just continues to go up. And there's been so many studies that have now linked this rise in sugar intake to not only the obesity crisis, but also increased incidence of metabolic diseases, increased risk for cancers, just increased risks for overall not feeling good about yourself. People have this sense of you know, not feeling healthy, not feeling well. So for many years, we heard that fat was demonized. Fat's bad for your heart. Fat isn't heart healthy. On the sly, what people didn't realize was happening was that if you take all the fat out of a product, it's going to taste terrible. So what do you do to make it taste better? You put sugar in it. So all the fat was being taken out, but all the sugar was being put in to make people still want to eat these food products. Fats, most people need good fats. So that should be a variety of fats. There are good fats. Not all fats are bad. I don't think fats should be demonized in any way. Things like monounsaturated fats are heart healthy. They could be good for you. Fat coming from an avocado, okay, that's great. But if it's fat coming from a fast food hamburger, 
well, maybe that's not so great. We have, you know, issues related to our soil where, you know, even when we're growing all these different foods on the farms, they're, the soil is nutrient depleted. So we're not necessarily getting the nutrients that we need because they're just not in the soil anymore. So there's lots of layers to the problem. I think there is a need for supplementation. If the adrenals aren't working, then the thyroid's probably not working either. So you could support both glands nutritionally, some nutritional supplements like selenium and iodine and zinc and magnesium and, of course, vitamin C. The other things that I look at are nutritional things, so things like vitamin D, B12. The B vitamins, vitamin C, these are all very important. You do have to work on the whole body, but short-term, digestive aids, all kinds. You can use different ones. Enzymes, you know, stomach acid support, uh, bile, you can take bile supplements to help break down fats. Most of the herbal supplements, or the supplements that address adrenals, are going to have the pretty much the same research, the adaptogenics, and those are going to be like the holy basil, the ashwagandha, the rhodiola. An adaptogen is an herb that comes from the earth, and we have receptors for these plants, and when, when the body is low, it helps to elevate us, and when we're elevated, it helps to calm us. It helps to put us in better balance. If you have some nutritional things that are off, it can really affect your energy. So we look at it from a, a supportive standpoint, and then we also look at it from a healing standpoint. And so I think in many ways, you know, supplements and diet have been a, a huge factor. Well, detox has a lot of different meanings for many different people. When I talk about detoxification, I'm talking about taking binders, I'm talking about taking chelators, natural and synthetic, to grab onto metals and remove them from the body. Toxic metals, I think everybody has them. So, you know, we have an epidemic of that. And with what I do, because I test, I take hair samples and I test them and send them to the lab, I see all the toxic metals. So I see, you know, the mercury, I see aluminum, I see cadmium. Copper becomes an issue, lead becomes an issue. I mean, they're all neurotoxins. And you have to find out the toxic metals that you have and the specific supplements that remove those metals. There's dozens of toxic metals and they all have different supplements and different substances that help to remove them. We're all exposed to toxic metals and environmental chemicals on a daily basis and many of us have been exposed to these for decades. You know, I, I think today we have to look at our toxic environments. You know, what cleaning products are you doing? What are you washing your clothes in? Because there's six neurotoxins on average in fabric softener. You could be in a moldy home. So you have to consider this. A simple online test. Visual contrast sensitivity. Start there. If you fail that test, you could have a neurotoxic issue and a mold issue. Detoxification done properly is a pretty involved process. Usually takes the experience of a professional health practitioner or a coach that's an expert in detoxification that can help you navigate all of the pitfalls. There's a conundrum with detox symptoms where when people start a detox, typically they can start releasing metals into their bloodstream that then kick off certain symptoms like fatigue and headaches and brain fog, nausea, things of that nature, the very symptoms they're trying to get rid of. There's a lot of things you can do to relieve detox symptoms. Take things like modified citrus pectins, take things like binders, charcoal, you can drink more water. What water are you drinking? You could buy a $200 reverse osmosis system and reduce that stress to your body. What about your air? You can add better filtration in your air, something called an ERV, or energy return ventilator that brings fresh air into your home. But the number one thing to know about detoxification is that it's actually a lifestyle. It's something that takes about two to three years to remove 80, per, 80 to 90% of the metals that you have in your body if done correctly. When we get hit with these major hidden toxic sources, they affect how our cells function and detox. If our cells aren't detoxing every day, you're going to get sick eventually. Now we get the cells removing the toxins on a daily basis. That's real detox. That's what saved my life and now thousands of others. Look at everything in your life and think about that bucket. How can I 
empty the bucket because ultimately that's how you're going to get your life back. They don't, they don't want to do that work. They don't want to change. They would rather drink you know, five cups of coffee that day. They'd rather go take a drug or do anything that is easy and fun rather than addressing the health issue because they look at this other person who is eating organic food and eating a lot of vegetables and not staying out at night and not drinking 10 cups of coffee a day. And that somehow has to be bad because if that were good, then they'd have to do it too. The explosion in popularity of coffee houses and coffee today as an industry, I think is a, there's a direct correlation between that liquid energy that comes from coffee and adrenal fatigue that people are experiencing. People are looking for a quick hit of energy. And so that's where we see people tired and wired, where their bodies are burned out, they're fried, but they're using this artificial version of energy to extract a little extra adrenaline from their body so that they can function and try to get through whatever project they might be working on. A recent study showed that the average American spends over 17 hours in front of screens every day, including televisions, computers, and smartphones. Uh, in today's world with cell phones, anybody's a prime candidate. Uh, that's one of the genius and yet not genius things about these smartphones is, is they've actually programmed the red dots and the dings and the buzzes and the messages, uh, the inbox, if you will, the direct messages, all of these things have now created a stress response in our body to the point that we actually now begin to have elevated stress levels by not checking our phone because we're concerned we're missing something. So anybody who's regularly spending time on a screen is already putting themselves very much into a fight or flight stress response. There's a time and place for accelerating and, and pushing it to the limits, but to push your body to the limits all the time, we're seeing the results of that. Antidepressants are through the roof, suicides are through the roof, um, people are arguably less happy than they ever were. I, I mean, I, I mean the, the writing's on the wall. Instead of revving up our body's nervous system, what we need to do is find ways to relieve stress and calm our body to get rest so our bodies can recover. Figuring that out is always hard. It's very easy to say, reduce your stress levels, right? <laughs> but then how do you do that? So, you know, that's, that gets a little bit more tricky, but I think you need to arrange your life. If, if there are certain people who are really stressful to you, get them out of your life. If you have a job that's too stressful, get a different job um, or somehow rearrange things or change your perspective or get you know, a counselor or a good friend who can talk you through some of the issues that you're experiencing. Understanding that I'm not a therapist, but I work very closely with therapists, and I often recommend that my patients start working with either a life coach or some mentor so they can really start adjusting the things that are within their control. We can start by teaching our patients how to turn down that sympathetic tone in the nervous system by teaching them how to breathe, we can teach them meditation, we can ask them to do yoga. There's already a great foundation of research showing that mindfulness-based practices, self-awareness techniques, uh, integrative approaches, acupuncture, Ayurvedic approaches, they change the brain and they change how the body copes with stress and fatigue. And the reason I call them self-awareness practices is because whether you're doing mindfulness, tai chi, yoga, qigong, mindful movement, dance, it really allows you to get in touch with yourself and know how you're feeling. If we're looking at lifestyle changes, um, I would definitely recommend sleeping more. Some people need it. And some people sit there and say, oh, I'm sleeping too much. I sleep 10 hours a night and, and I'm you know, still tired and it's too much. And that's not too much. If you can sleep 10 hours, you need 10 hours. Stem cells. Uh, I believe that there's a lot with regenerative medicine beyond just joint pain, which it's more accepted for now. You know, it's funny when I talk about stem cells uh, to people, one of the first things they say is, is that legal? 
<laughs> because we, at least us older people, we go back to Christopher Reeve's days, right? It's like where it was such a controversy, but what people have to realize is it's come a long way. They don't have to kill uh, babies or embryos to get stem cells. They can get them right from your hip, uh, you know, with a local anesthetic. Uh, they can get it from your fat and they can get it from cords uh, of babies. Uh, I've read some studies now you know, where people with severe adrenal problems, uh, even disease, let alone just adrenal fatigue, are responding amazing to stem cells. Um, pretty high dose red light therapy. So red, infrared, far infrared, and we also use hyperbaric oxygen. Red light therapy has a huge implication on mitochondrial function and our ability to heal mitochondria and produce the energy we need to heal. And then hyperbaric oxygen, because oxygen is the fuel that our cells need to recover. And right now, you and I just sitting here breathing the way we are, we're, we're basically already getting all the oxygen that we really can. So we're, we're, 100, we're almost 100% saturated right now just having this conversation. So if we want to get more oxygen than that, there's really only one option, which is pressurized oxygen. I've taken all the different recommendations I've learned and put them together in this thing that I'm calling the tree of health. Everyone should probably drink more water, but the type of water you drink is really important as well. Probably the best type of water to drink is spring or mineral water. You could drink completely purified water, like distilled or reverse osmosis, but you have to have minerals added to them if you drink it. You can buy mineral supplements online that are designed specifically to mix with this kind of water to give you the minerals you need. You should definitely not drink tap water. And if you get one of those common pitcher filters, they don't filter out things like chlorine or aluminum. You definitely want to avoid alcohol, caffeine, and sugary drinks. Your primary thing that you drink should be water. In terms of food, you want to be clean, natural, and organic as possible. When you eat meat, you can still eat beef, but the best kind is really grass-fed beef. It's shown that grass-fed beef has a better lipid profile. Organic chicken and turkey are also great. When you eat vegetables, and you should eat a lot of them, you should eat cooked vegetables as well as raw. Many people don't get enough cooked vegetables, and you should probably have more cooked than raw vegetables. The best oils are avocado for cooking and olive for putting on things like salad. You really shouldn't use things like salad dressing on your salad because they have so many added ingredients and sugars. You should avoid canola oil and cheap cooking oil, as well as margarine. And of course, don't eat fast food. In terms of your lifestyle, there's a lot of things you can do to increase your health through changing your life. One of the things you can do is stress management. Try to get stressful things out of your life, whether they be people or situations. Make sure you get proper sleep. Whatever you believe, meditation is good for you. And if you do pray, prayer is also helpful. Yoga and Qigong specifically help move energy through the body and have been shown to help people mentally and physically. Time in nature, being outdoors and seeing the sun and the grass and the sky. Also taking time to rest and taking breaks during your day are important. We spend way too many hours a day looking at computer screens. We should probably avoid those as much as we can, even though for our jobs, we probably have to look at them. We want to avoid being overstimulated. Take a moment between activities to just breathe. And of course, we want to make sure that toxic people are out of our lives. When taking supplements, it is essential that you see a practitioner. A practitioner could come up with a tailored supplement plan just for you. The consensus of practitioners and people I've interviewed seems to be that vitamin C and D, zinc, selenium, calcium, and magnesium are all helpful for this condition. Also the adaptogens, including ashwagandha and rhodiola. We should also avoid taking mega doses of vitamins. Multivitamins aren't really that great because they are not targeted. They might give you some supplements or minerals that you don't need, or might not give you enough of some you do need. Cheap brands of vitamins and supplements can actually contain toxins by the manufacturing process or where they were harvested, so you should avoid those as well. So, 
Over the years, I've learned a lot of different things and after going on my diet and doing the supplements with Nikki, I've gotten a lot better. I'm not completely better yet. I still have tinnitus sometimes ringing in my ears. I still have bad headaches that I get. I'd probably say I get a bad headache about once every other week. That's really bad so I can't do anything. I still have fatigue. I have, I usually call them fatigue episodes. They last about two hours, three hours where I really can't do much. I have trouble thinking. I kind of shut down. Sometimes I'll have entire fatigue days where the whole day is just still gone. I only have maybe about two or three of those a month, but it still happens and it's still difficult to deal with. And when I get those days, I often have a lot of brain fog and muscle pain and, um, and I might get a headache to go along with those days too. Uh, it just depends. So I'm still not all the way to better. I don't think I could work 40 hours a week. I've adjusted my life so I work about 20 to 30 and that's enough to keep me alive but maybe not in luxury. <laughs> but I've gotten a lot healthier by just eliminating processed foods and eliminating sugar and wheat and eating a lot of cooked vegetables, eating clean, trying not to eat out very often. So, though I haven't fully recovered, I've gotten a lot better and, and the anxiety's a lot better. Um, I'd say it's more like normal person anxiety now instead of like what I would call the dread horror anxiety. But there's hope. If I got better, then, then you can too. I think in terms of solutions for it, I actually think there's a lot of good stuff out there um, in the nutritional world. I would, once you have a way to test the condition, then obviously you can test the treatments, right? And I don't know that the first thing would be to develop new treatments. I would take the testing protocol and apply it to existing treatments to see, you know, what's working and what isn't. So the, in the early 80s, there was an interesting uh, story that was told to me. Uh, they got the first private MRI and I believe it was in a hospital in Pennsylvania. And all these women who were labeled as histrionic reactions, so they had all these weird neurological signs, were sent to get this MRI done because it was brand new at the time. And it turns out they all had multiple sclerosis. And, but because we didn't have the testing, they were labeled as histrionic and, and psychiatrically diseased. And of course it turned out not to be true. And we're finding that out with fibromyalgia. Now we're saying, oh my God, they do have biological markers and so now it's becoming much more an accepted diagnosis. So we really should not be looking at the adrenals anywhere isolated from the HPA axis, the hypothalamus, uh, thyroid, pituitary, the gonads, the ovaries, the testes, all of these endocrine glands work together. You're going to ask me what I think that name should be, and I'm not that clever. <laughs> um, but uh, <laughs> but I, I do agree. I, I think it's a misleading term because we think it to be so simple. It's just I wiped out my adrenals because of too much stress. It's not so simple. So my approach would be to take the fatigue out of the name and take the adrenal out of the name and to really focus on where the deficiency is and the deficiencies in the energy. Until we get enough, unfortunately, patients suffering from that illness that we could at least categorize it, you know, into some, some syndrome of some kind where we can at least, that, you know, name it for the sake of, you know, being able to start to help these people. Since I've been making this documentary, I've been thinking of a new name for adrenal fatigue. I'm not a doctor, but I feel like I've come up with a good one. Stress Maladaptation Syndrome. Since it's clear that this condition is a response to stress, whether it is physical, mental, or chemical, that it should be included in the name. Maladaptation means an adaptation that has gone bad in some way. Our bodies try to deal with stress the best they can, but when they run out of resources or get overwhelmed or have simply too many toxins inside, they struggle to adjust. Primarily, our body systems try to keep us alive. 
I see it like a plane where, yes, there's smoke, and the paint job looks pretty bad, and some of the controls have broken, but it is still flying. That's what our bodies sometimes have to do to adapt to overwhelming stress. That's stress maladaptation syndrome. And so I view it as an energetic dissonance where the body and the person are spending time and energy on things, whether it's stress or trauma or medical conditions or whatever it is, that's taking them away from their ultimate path of where they want to be going. A person without stress maladaptation syndrome will have a good range where they can handle stress in their lives. Sometimes they will feel anxious or fatigued, as is normal. But in my experience, someone with stress maladaptation syndrome has a much smaller range where they feel okay. And it only takes a little stress to push them into fatigue or anxiety states. In extreme situations, a sufferer rarely or never feels okay. And the anxiety and fatigue become so intense that they often suffer both at the same time. So what should everybody know about adrenal fatigue? You should know that it's real. You should know that most Americans probably suffer from some version of it. You should know that it's definitely a diagnosable situation. But most importantly, you should know that regardless of how far you are along in that spectrum, it's fixable. You can heal. You just need to understand where you are in that spectrum, which areas are creating that for you in your life, and then a strategy that you can implement that could start shifting you back in the right direction. Uh, I really think the concept of adrenal fatigue is nature's a uh, little bit beyond gentle nudging to really take stock of our uh, attitudes and our stress level and that we seek the proper healing for the, the wear and tear of life, which is a, there's a lot of emotional healing that needs to be done, physical support, mental healing. And we go back, I think it's really embrace the holistic model. That's uh, the model that's based on nature and the human being's interaction with nature. How do we apply nature's laws in a modern world where we don't give up the convenience of the cell phone or you know the computers and the internet and everything that that humanity is evolving into but how do we take those rough edges off that are hurting us I, I think having more compassion and more patience and more empathy and sympathy for people for everyone because we're all going through something and and the sooner that we that we get to that then the, the sooner we're gonna win together I know it can be really challenging because we just want to pick up our socks and kind of keep going. That's what we're taught in our culture. So what you need to know is that there's something physiological going on here that is not in their head, that they need support, especially now. And so the only person that can fully understand what's going on inside that body is you. And so you fight for that. You fight to be heard and you fight to get well. And in a system that wants to ignore those symptoms, you need to keep on going until you find the right practitioner to sit with you because you can get well. So if we don't shift this paradigm now, it's going to sh show up in these future generations. And for me, what that would look like if we were all supported is that we would have less work. We would have um, siesta. I mean, if you look at the other side of the world, they're doing it right. There's something here that we're missing in this culture. If you're alive, you have the capacity to heal. And so as long as you know that and continue to create an improved lifestyle around that, you will see positive change. Hopefully with all the things that we talked about in this documentary, there'll be something that helps you. I don't know, because nobody knows about this thing, right? Nobody understands exactly what this is or what's going on, but I did what I could in this documentary, and, and I hope that it, it's helpful to you. 
and that you feel better. That's really what this is for.